sees American citizens uh, in the nebulous terms of that section who substantially support terrorist groups or associated forces, hold them in military compounds uh, without due process, and in, including in our offshore penal colonies, by the way, um, indefinitely, until in the language of that section what they call the end of hostilities. Now, the aggressive response on the part of the Obama administration leads those of us who are involved in this case to believe uh, that the uh, Obama administration is already using this uh, provision. I would, if I had to speculate, I would guess on uh, nationals of probably dual, uh, who have dual citizenship, Pakistani Americans, for instance, who I, I would suspect are being held in places like Bagram. Uh, I think that they were so aggressive because uh, once uh, Judge Forrest issued that injunction, in essence, invalidating the law, uh, if they still held these people, they would be uh, in contempt of court. I see. Uh, and now we're about to be, you know, about to see uh, a battle in an appellate court. That's the court above the federal court before you get to the Supreme Court, which on September 28th will review the decision by Judge Forrest. And uh, if it upholds that decision, then uh, I am almost certain we will be in the Supreme Court in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Judge Forrest actually made the observation that uh, this particular piece of legislation goes beyond the authorization for the use of military force uh, legislation. Well, the so, argument of the lawyers, uh, you know, the lawyers argued, the government lawyers argued that uh, there was no difference between the authorization to use military force and the NDAA, that the government uh, uh, was empowered under the authorization to use military force act uh, to carry out these kinds of detentions. Um, I mean, that is just completely specious. Why would they legislate again? Well, it, exactly, and this is a question the judge asked. And if it's true that they have those powers, why would they react so aggressively uh, after Judge Forrest refused their motion for a stay on the injunction and demand an emergency stay and an emergency appeal? So it exposes, in essence, the lie uh, that the government spun in the court, because if the NDAA was just a reiteration of what had already been laid out in the authorization to use Military Force Act, then it wouldn't matter if there was an injunction. And indeed, in Judge Forrest's 112-page opinion, uh, which is we're really worth reading, uh, she makes precisely that point. Yeah, and it remains, remains a mystery. Um, Tangerine Bolin, did, did you expect Judge Forrest's ruling this way, or was the main real intention of you and other plaintiffs simply to publicize your concerns over Section 1021? Oh, I absolutely hoped for this ruling. I mean, I, you know, she kind of, she she pegged it beyond my wildest dreams because she's, she's really seen, connected the dots and seen the entire picture here. And what you guys were just touching upon, the differences or similarity between the AUMF and NDAA, just want to reiterate what, what Chris said. The government has been completely specious in their arguments throughout. They have repeatedly claimed that the detention powers under these two laws are co-equal. And yet at the end, they had this sudden sense of urgency and, you know, absolutely had to have our injunction, uh, have a stay on our injunction. I think that what is happening here is that we are the latch on a Pandora's box, and the Pandora's box is the last 11 years of the AUMS being incredibly over-broadly applied, as Chris intimated, and uh, possibly... Um, we could see a lot of cases around the world coming back to haunt the U.S. because of that overbroad interpretation. So they've essentially tried to sneak in, as Judge Forrest aptly stated in her, in her ruling, a retroactive legislative fix to the all too narrow, they think, powers of the AUMF. So yeah. I hoped for this, certainly. Um, but what's, what's scary is Judge Forrest, I think, is a once-in-a-lifetime judge. She's strictly constitutional. She, she absolutely knows her stuff. And we see a history here of, unfortunately, judges kowtowing to this a false national security narrative that ensures this constant incredible encroachment on our rights. It, it has, on the face of it, a, a number of rather loose uses of terminology or associated forces in addition to al-Qaeda and Taliban and people who, uh, who are associated in some way with, with actions that are not, that are not clearly defined. Um, 
how heavily would that weigh in a review by a higher court, if at all? Well, I can, if I can just speak to that, um, and then mm. you as well. Um, you had mentioned uh, material support as one of the issues, that the uh, sorry, the terms that were vague. It actually was uh, uh, substantial support and directly supported. Um, the difference between those in, in case law, material support has been clearly defined and affirmed again and again. Substantial support, mere words could be construed to have provided substantial support to a terrorist group. That's why we brought this case forward. The language in 1021b2 is so vague and so sweeping, it's completely contrary to the very narrow definition of the AUMS. And it does encompass people like Chris Hedges and myself and other WikiLeaks supporters and People, you know, it encompasses basically anyone and everyone that they feel like arbitrarily detaining at any time, forever. <laughs> so it's shocking that the government has mean, persisted in this specious argument that they're the same, but unfortunately we're facing this incredibly, the systemic issue of the mainstream media not picking up on the nuances of this case and the nuances when you start to realize what's happening. And I'm not just being prejudiced here. I think this is hands down the most important civil liberties case in a decade. Yeah. So, but they're missing it. So. Indeed. <laughs> the use of the word "until the end of host oh, the phrase "until the end of hostilities" um, and, uh, in reference to the war against, if you can call it that, Al Qaeda and the Taliban and their associates. I mean, "until the end of hostilities" means uh, whatever you want it to mean, uh, forever and ever. Yep. There are no geographic or temporal limitations on the NDAA. Quite hmm. different from the AUMF. Chris, um, how hard is this going to be to police in, in this sense? I mean, or has the government got every flexibility uh, that it could ever want? So therefore, it's not going to be that difficult. Can't police it at all because if you're seizing people and not giving them access to any legal representation and holding them in an age of permanent war indefinitely, uh, people can be disappeared, in essence, off the face of the earth, off American soil. Hmm. Nobody knows where they are, and the government doesn't have to tell you that they have them. So you can't, it, it's impossible to police. And Judge Forrest, in her opinion, and in the final hearing in August, raised the issue of the 110,000 Japanese Americans who were put in internment camps during World War II. Uh, and how this kind of legislation allows the government to, in essence, carry out a dragnet, sweeping up uh, all sorts of people uh, that they define uh, through these nebulous terms as being involved in terrorism. I think one of the most chilling moments in the trial was when, uh, before the court, uh, emails that had been passed uh, back and forth uh, in, in Stafford, the Stafford security firm, and, and we got those emails because WikiLeaks dumped five million of them, sought to link uh, an organization called U.S. Day of Rage, and Alex O'Brien from that organization was one of the plaintiffs, to Al-Qaeda. Yes. Uh, we also saw this with Occupy London. And that's precisely what you do. You get these laws passed in the name of, of, of the war on terror. And then uh, you take legitimate uh, dissidents and, and, and movements of dissent and you link them uh, to terrorist organizations and you crush them. And that is exactly the template that took place uh, in the Cold War, in, in the age of, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of anti-communist hysteria. Yeah. In the, especially in the 1950s that purged universities, newspapers, uh, writers, actors, musicians, thousands of people. So we're, not, out, we're, effectively, the, we're uh, effectively going back to a period which we thought had passed, which is very chilling. Thank you both. Uh, it's been good to talk to you. Chris Hedges and Tangerine Bolland. Bolland.